morning, everyone. Please stand for our first song. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We pray that you'll lift us up and draw us close to you that we might know you better this morning. Open up our hearts to, to hear your word and to hear your voice, to hear your calling on our lives through it. We pray that we glorify your name as we open up our mouths and our hearts and, and praise and worship to you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Hope everybody had a uh, Merry Christmas. 2020 has almost come to a close. We hope that all the garbage that came along with it 
stays stays here next week as we cross into 2021. So I hope everybody was safe and had a good time, enjoyed family and friends, and and then took the advice from last week that we before we open up presents, we open up the Bible and see what God has done for us in our life. The greatest gift of all that God sent forth His Son that He might bring salvation for those who put their faith and trust in Him. So I, I pray that. Uh, I'm confident that you put Christ first before we, right? Santa Claus doesn't bring the greatest gifts. It's God sent forth his son as we looked at Galatians 4 last week. Just a couple of announcements. We'll get back to our worship. Just a, so we're going to take one more week. We won't meet again this Wednesday. The following Wednesday, that first Wednesday in January, January the 6th, we'll gather back on uh, Wednesday evening for our Bible study as we begin our new series. We're going to do a 15-week study in the doctrines of the church. The first doctrine that we're going to cover is the doctrine of, of the Trinity. So we'll, we'll kick that off on January the 6th or 7 o'clock. We invite everybody to come and, and, and join us for that study as we go through each doctrine. I think the, the week after that, we'll talk about the doctrine of sin. Why doctrines, when we talk about doctrine, it's, it's what we believe. We'll define it. What's the definition of the Trinity? What's the Bible say about it? And why is it important? Why is it important for us to hold on to as a church, as we've talked about in weeks past, is when we start letting go of doctrines, when we push this one to the side and scratch, scratch this one out, erase that one. That's how heresy begins to infiltrate uh, many churches. When we toss out doctrine and begin to, to build our own doctrine on what we, are, the doctrine of the gospel of our own opinion, um, that's the dangerous, the dangerous view of the church. So we'll start with the doctrine of the Trinity, and we have 14 more after that. Um, I tried to. There, One's not more important than the other, but I try to put them in an order where it made sense as we as we go through that 15 weeks, as they continue to build on one another, doctrine of creation, <clears throat> sanctification, justification, glorification, the doctrine of the second coming, and so on and so forth. So uh, we'll begin that on January the 6th at 7 o'clock. Invite everybody to come out um, and, and start uh, that study with us. That's all the announcements we got. Sorry. No. 
Ja się tam. Jacob, you want to pray this morning? Have your Bible open up to John chapter 17 as we get back into the Gospel of John. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer. If you ever hear somebody reference that, they're speaking about John chapter 17. The whole chapter is a prayer from our Lord. This is really the Lord's Prayer. When we think of the Lord's Prayer, we think of our Father who art in heaven. Well, that's that's a disciple's prayer. That's Jesus teaching us how to pray. This is the true Lord's Prayer as Jesus turns to the Father right before he goes to the cross and begins to pray. These first 12 chapters as we went through John, and we're a little over a year now we've been in the Gospel of John, the first 12 chapters represent Jesus' public ministry, his preaching, his works, his teaching, what was proclaimed in Mark 1.16, the time was fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's been played out in our first 12 chapters here. It was called the time of consideration. Jesus presented himself to the people as the Messiah. Now it was up to them to consider whether or not they believed him. And by the time we get to the end of chapter 12, many people have fallen away. They've turned their back because his words were too much to bear. We find ourselves in a similar situation these days. Many people are turning away because the words are just too much. Too much to bear. And then Jesus makes his triumphant entry into Jerusalem in chapter 12. And then the beginning of chapter 13, he turns inward, beginning to prepare his disciples for his departure. His public ministry is over. Now it's time for private instruction. And that's what chapters 13 through 16 cover. It begins with the Last Supper. And it ends as the group begins to go to Gethsemane. And then the whole of chapter 17 is a prayer given by Jesus. The high priestly prayer. Verses 1 through 5 are for himself. Verses 16 through 19 are for the disciples. And then verses 20 through 26 are for the future believers, for us. And then once we get to chapter 18, the passion begins. Jesus is arrested. He's tried, crucified, buried. And then on the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. Jesus' ministry is now complete. It's time for prayer before he fulfills his purpose of coming into the world. First, Jesus goes to the Father to make intercession for us in prayer, and then he goes and makes intercession for us on the cross. We're going to spit it up, split it up into two sermons. It was just too much to try to fit into one Sunday morning. So this morning, we're gonna look at verses one through 11. John chapter 17, 1 through 11 says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, 
Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I come from you, and they have believed that you have sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. As we go back and look at the first three verses there, when Jesus had spoken these words, it begins, this is everything that's taken place between chapters 13 and 16. Those four chapters took place just a matter of just in a couple of hours. Chapter 13 begins with the Last Supper, and then Jesus begins to instruct the disciples, preparing them for this moment that's about to come. Now Jesus is done speaking with the disciples and now turns and speaks to the Father. He says, the hour has come. We've seen that term several times throughout the gospel. It's speaking of that predetermined hour that was set forth before the foundation of the world, that God would send his son to die in our place. The very reason that Christ has come into the world, that Roman cross, the instrument of pain and death will now become the instrument of our salvation. The shed blood of Christ will atone for our sins. As Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, for our sake, see how it begins. Why? For our sake, for your sake, he made him, speaking of God the Father, made God the Son. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, eternal God. The pre-incarnate Christ, who knew no sin, was never a part of it. But for our sake, he made him to be sin. Why? Paul answered, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God makes us righteous. He cleanses us from that filth, from that sin, and makes us righteous. He makes us holy. It's called sanctified. He sanctified us in his presence. That hour hath now come. It's finally here. In the fullness of time, as we looked at Galatians 4 last week, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Here we are. As we celebrated the incarnation last week, God sending forth his son. Now we come to the point of why is to redeem us from the curse of the law. The law is precious on one hand because it shows us where we fall short. It shows us what we need to correct in our lives in order to become righteous with God. It shows us the line that we shouldn't cross, but then on the other hand, it's a curse because it condemns us. And Christ came to do what the law could not do, and that save us from that condemnation. That's why Paul could say in Romans 8, 1, there is thou and there, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The hour has come. The fullness of time has come. This wasn't a last-minute plan. Our sin didn't catch God by surprise. He knew before he created us 
that we were going to end up in the state that we're at now. And he knew that when we ended up in the state, that the only way to save us was to send forth his son. God knew all that and created us anyway. The hour has come as Jesus lift up his eyes to heaven. Father, the hour has come. In verses 1 and 2, we have two statements and then two purpose clauses, similar to what we saw last week in Galatians 4, 4. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. That's the statement. And then verse 5 gives us the two purposes for it. Number one, to redeem us from under the law. Number two, so that we might become adopted as children of God. We see something similar here in these verses. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. That's the statement. And then the purpose clause follows it. Why? So that the son may glorify you. And then another statement. You have given him, Jesus is speaking, you've given me authority over all flesh. Flesh is just a generic word. It means over all people, over all things. You've given me authority over all things. Why? The clause is given after it. In order to give eternal life to all whom you have given. The Father is glorified because the Son goes to the cross. The cross wasn't the darkest moment in history, as it's often portrayed. The cross wasn't a failure. It wasn't some last minute decision that everything else has failed. Let's resort to the last thing. God will send his son. No, that was the plan all along from before the foundation of the world. The cross wasn't the low point in history. It's the crowning glory of God. It's his love and his grace that shines through on the cross. And because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, he's glorified. And because he's glorified, the Father is also glorified. When Jesus resurrected in his glorified body, he appears to the disciples in chapter 20, as we'll get to in a few weeks. And the other gospels presented as well. Jesus is raised with marks on his hands and his feet. He still has the scar on his side from where the spear entered his flesh. He even invites Thomas to put his hand in my side so that you might know. When we're glorified, we're glorified in perfection. We're perfect. No more impurities, no more sicknesses, no more scars. We're glorified in perfection. Jesus went to the cross as the perfect lamb. He was without blemish. Yet when he rose from the grave, he rose with scars. How is that? If we're glorified in perfection, it's because his scars are his perfection. That was his very purpose of coming into the world. It wasn't a disgrace. It was his crowning glory. And he'll wear those scars for all eternity. When he was raised, he was raised in perfection. He bears the scars on his hands and his feet. Showing his great love with which he had us for us. Because of his richness and mercy. We're told with a great love and which he loved us. He's glorified with his scars because they are his perfection. They are his glory. 
And because of that, he glorifies the Father because he accomplished what the Father has sent him to do. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Is Jesus' prayer. And the Son was glorified because of his work on the cross. And the Father is glorified through the Son. And then we come to the second statement that goes with the first. The cross accomplished the redemptive purposes of God because the Son has been given all authority over all people in order to give them eternal life. This is why he came. This is why he went to the cross to redeem us from under the law so that we might have eternal life in his name. And since it's the Son who carried out this redemptive purpose, since it was his life that was given so that we might live, all authority has been given to him. All people has been given into his hands, either for eternal life or for judgment, because judgment has been given into his hands as well. In verse 3, it says, This is eternal life. Before, Jesus ex explained why he came, to give eternal life. Verse 3, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The eternal life is given for those who believe, for those who have received him and believe in his name, as John told us all the way back in chapter 1. In verses 12 and 13, for those who did receive him, for those who did believe on his name, he gave the right to become children of God, that's born again. Adopted children of the Father. You cannot know God unless you know Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Jesus told us back in chapter 14 and verse 6. I wrote verse 7 down. said 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We've already covered that, right? When it says there, no one comes to the Father. In the Greek, it means no one comes to the Father, right? Except through me. No one has access to the Father unless they go through the Son. He told us similar in Matthew Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Jesus says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. That's similar to what he just said in John chapter 17. Since you've given him, Jesus, authority over all flesh. That means over all people, over all things. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. You cannot know the Father without the Son. You have to know the Son. You must be redeemed by the Son in order to know the Father. Any other religion that doesn't have Jesus at the center is a false religion, preaching a false gospel, giving false hope to people. There's only one way. The world will tell you that there's all kinds of there. Many roads to Rome, the world teaches you. The world hates Christianity because it's exclusive. We say, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. There's one way, and that's through Christ. There is no other way. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Verses 4 and 5. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus speaks here in a manner that the work that he's getting ready to do has already been accomplished. It's in past tense. 
I glorified you on earth. Past tense. Having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Past tense. It's as good as done. He's still a few hours away from being crucified, yet he can say, it's accomplished. Because there's nothing that's going to get in his way. What was about to happen was as good as done. Because no one takes his life from him. He gives it up willingly. Jesus' purpose was the cross and there wasn't anything or anybody that was going to stand in the way. Jesus could say, it is finished, before he hung on the cross and said, it is finished. God's purpose will always be fulfilled regardless of any human involvement. For about 33 years, Jesus lived among us. The word became flesh and dwelt with us. I wonder how often that he thought about this moment, not necessarily the cross, but the moment for him to go back to the Father, to return to his glory. What he gave up in order to come here. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. We can hear the anticipation in his words. John's gospel begins, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He told us in his two opening verses, and now John can say, I told you so. He's been waiting 17 chapters to say, I told you so. He was with him before the world existed. The incarnation entailed a forfeiture of his glory. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, we're all familiar with what's called the Christ hymn. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 6, Paul says, Who, speaking of Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He was in the form of God because he was God. He was fully God. God in the flesh, but he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. Paul's saying he didn't use that as an excuse or a reason to fulfill his purpose, even though it was his prerogative to do as God. No, verse 7, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of man. What did he empty himself of? His glory with which he had with the Father before the world existed. He emptied himself of that glory. He emptied himself of the prerogative of being God in order to become one of us. Again, the word taking the form, right? Verse 6, he was in the form of God. Verse 7, now he's in the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men because he was fully man. And again in verse 8, the word form, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Humbled himself to the point of death, not just any death, death on the cross. The worst way to die. Humbled himself. He was in the form of God, took on the form of a servant, humbled himself by becoming obedient. How many of us have a problem with humility? The form of God took on the form of a servant, humbled himself, became obedient 
to the point of death, even death on a cross. How often do we humble ourselves? How many times do we hear someone say, or do we even hear ourselves say, I want to be just like Jesus, but without the meekness, without the humility, without the suffering, without the obedience, without being a servant, without submission, without suffering, without the pain, without the cross, without the death. Other than that, I want to be just like Jesus. He humbled himself, gave up his glory, and that's why the rest of the chapter 2, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whether you want to or not, or whether you like it or not, your knee will bow when Christ appears, and you will call him Lord. It's either going to be done in exaltation, or it's going to done, be done with great regret. Because you'll call out, Lord, Lord, and Jesus will say, depart from me, for I never knew you the worst words anyone could ever hear. Back in John 17, verses 6 through 8, Jesus turns to the disciples, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you have gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they received them and have come to know in truth that I come from you and you and they have believed that you sent me Jesus turns to his disciples he says I've made your name known to them I've manifested your name to those that you've given me he's speaking specifically here of the disciples I've taught them your word I've instructed them in your ways I gave them the word and they received it. They've come to know the truth that Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of God. He's been sent by God, he says. In all of chapter 17, Jesus mentions either coming from the Father or being sent from the Father seven times. It's important. It's an important theological truth that Jesus was not just sent by God, he was sent from God. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son because he was in the beginning with God. We must have a correct understanding of who the son is ever before we can ever know who the father is. And this is why that theological proof is so important. He was sent by God because he is of God. He is God who had the same glory before the world existed. Verses 9 through 11. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you, with you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus said, he's praying for the disciples, not for the world, but for them. This doesn't mean that Jesus is unconcerned for the world. We know that's not true. We're told that in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that that's why he sent his son. But in this particular instance, he's praying specifically for the disciples. We come later, right? We're not completely left out. In verse 20, Jesus turns to us 
When he says, I do not ask for only these, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. But he wants to pray for them first. Because Jesus knows the opposition that they're going to face in the advancement of the gospel. He's leaving the world and going back to the Father. And the disciples are going to be left in the world. Just as he told them at the end of chapter 16 in verse 33, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. They will experience tribulation, persecution, and death. And Jesus prays that they'll be able to overcome these obstacles before they get there. In Luke's gospel, right about this same time frame before Jesus is arrested in Luke 22, Jesus turns to Peter in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32, Jesus turns to Peter and says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I pray for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. I pray for you. This is the prayer here that he's given in John 17. I'm praying for, for you. He prays for Peter. He prays, prays for the rest of the disciples that they'll be able to overcome the tribulations that lay ahead of them. Jesus addresses the Father as Holy Father. The only time that's used. This form of address prepares the way for what he says in verses 17 through 19, which we'll get into next week. But it says this, as he's still speaking about the disciples, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may be sanctified in truth. The word sanctified, it comes from the same root word for holy in the Greek. The word for holy is hagios. Sanctified is hagiazo. It comes from the same word. It means to be set apart, to be dedicated to, to be made pure, consecrated. God has sanctified you. He's set you apart. He's consecrated. He's made you pure. He's cleansed you and made you righteous. Why would anybody want to turn around and go back and wallow in filth after he's cleansed you? God is the Holy Father that makes us holy. And when we come to faith, we are sanctified, as Paul tells us. We've been dedicated to God, set apart and consecrated by God and for God. That's why he who was without sin became sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. He has made us righteous. We were unrighteous and unholy. He has made us righteous and holy. Why would we take something that he's made righteous and holy and then go back into the life that we had before and make it unrighteous and unholy. We're no longer of the world. We are his children, and his children are not of the world. They're born again from above, as John said back in chapter 1. As we talked about Last week, you can't be a slave of sin and a son of God. You can't be both. It's not both and. It's either or. You can't continue to live a life of sin and then call yourself a child of God. You're either a slave to that sin 
or you're his child who has been sanctified and consecrated. And you behave in that manner, not continually running back to the things that he's already saved you from. In the Old Testament law, there were certain things that couldn't be eaten. The dietary laws, it would make them unclean. They would be defiled and therefore unholy. It would completely break relationship with the Father. So there were certain things they had to do before they could come and worship. In Leviticus chapter 11, there's a list of these things that they were not allowed to eat. Don't eat this, don't eat that, lest you become defiled. And then in Leviticus 11, 44, God is speaking, for I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. Even though that food doesn't defile us any longer, there's other things that we can do that defile us and make us unrighteous and unholy. There's whole lists of sins throughout the New Testament that Paul gives that shows us that when we do these things, we are not righteous. He gives a list in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Saying, don't do these. Right beginning in verse 9. I'm sure I've read this verse a few times over the last couple of years. And I'm sure I've ex explained it each time as I will here. Because we gloss over verse 9. We look over it, gloss over it, skip it, scratch it out, or make it say something other than what it says. I don't have to interpret this verse for you because it says what it says and it means what it means. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So we can try to twist that however we want you to make it mean something else, but that's what it means. Paul says, don't you know, don't be ignorant. He says, I don't want you to not know this. It would be irresponsible of me for you not to know this. And remember, he's writing to the church in Corinth. I want you to know, you need to know this, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he follows that up with, by saying, do not be deceived. Because apparently they were. The same deception that goes around today. When we say, well, surely not. These things don't make someone unrighteous to the point to where they don't inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, I need you to know this. Because it's irresponsible that if I don't tell you, just as it's irresponsible of me, if I don't tell you, and just like it's irresponsible of anyone else who stands behind a pulpit and reads these verses and tries to tell you that it means something else than what it says. You need to know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. We must be righteous. We must be holy. And then he gives a list of sins. Neither the sexually immoral. That's just a broad blanket statement. But we all find loopholes in that, surely. We're a people of loopholes. Nor idolaters. Right? Listen for your name if it's called in these verses. Because if it is, then you need to do something about it. Sexually immoral. Idolaters. Anyone who puts something above God is an idolater. Adulterers. Sexual relationships outside the marriage covenant. Nor men who practice homosexuality. Nor thieves. Nor the greedy. Nor drunkards. Nor revilers. Nor swindlers. Will inherit the kingdom of God. 
And I'll stop there. Sexual immorality in our culture is glorified. But according to God's word, it's what separates us. It's probably the worst thing that we do. We convince ourselves that it's no big deal. The culture has convinced us that it's no big deal. It's no big deal. You're not hurting anybody. You're not doing anything wrong. Paul mentions sexual immorality three times in these couple of verses. He begins with the sexual immoral. The broad statement. This is for you young people or for those who are unmarried. Sex before marriage is unrighteous. And then he goes to adulterers. Sex outside of marriage is unrighteous. And then he goes outside of that covenant to homosexuality. Those who break God's creative order between a man and a woman. So as we say that sexual immorality is not a big deal, I say to all you young people that's in here and all those who aren't married, it is a big deal. Because Paul says, do you not know that unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? We are called to be holy and called to be righteous. Christ is our example. And when we don't live up to that example, we fall short in our sanctification. We're to become more like him each and every day. Jesus says, Holy Father, keep them in your name. The name of God throughout the Bible is a sign of security and safety and power. In Psalm 54, 1, the psalmist says, O oh God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. Proverbs 18, 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Jesus' prayer was for the Father to keep his disciples safe in his name. God has given you his word. And if you've been saved and he's separated you from this world, do not conform to the old pattern of yourself. If you've been cleansed, why would you run back to be uncleansed? Because Satan wants to sift you like wheat. That's what Jesus told Peter. And then later on, years later, as Peter wrote his letter, his first letter, he says, Satan is a roaring lion. He prowls around looking who he can devour. He took what Jesus, Peter took what Jesus told him and then gave it to the church. Satan desires to sift you like wheat. Don't run back to that same pattern, that same sinful nature as I didn't get to in 1 Corinthians 6. Right? After he gives all that list, Paul says in verse 11, as such were some of you. Past tense. It doesn't mean that if you've ever done those things that you can't be saved from them. Remember, he's writing to the church. People are sitting in church. You were all of these things, Paul says. Were some of you. But you've repented and you've turned to God as such were, but you were washed, Paul says. You've been cleansed by the blood of Christ. You were sanctified. There's that word. You've been sanctified and made holy. <clears throat> made righteous. Don't turn back to those same things. It says you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. To be justified means to be not guilty. Paul says you were guilty of all of those things, but Christ has cleansed you from it. He separated you and sanctified you, made you holy, and now you're not guilty. Don't turn and run back to those things. Separate yourself. 
and be holy for I am holy, God says. Don't conform to the old pattern of yourself, the sinful nature, as were such some of you, Paul says, past tense. We have to leave our sinful past in the past. We can't continue to run back to it. Does it mean that we're never going to sin or fall short? Of course not. We fall short every single day. But we don't go running back to those things. Be conformed and consecrated by the word of Christ that can bring salvation to your souls. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we had this morning. We pray that your word penetrates our hearts and minds. Help us be holy. You've sanctified us. Now give us the strength to be righteous and holy in an unrighteous and unholy world. We're different from everyone else. They look at us different. They treat us different. And when we don't run after the same things that they're after, there's something wrong with us, according to them. Give us the strength to overcome. If you sanctified and justified us, then we know that you'll empower us through your Holy Spirit to remain that way, to remain pure, that we might glorify you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, we pray that today that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. Happy to talk to you as the song goes. If you want to stay afterwards, can you speak about salvation or about baptism? Happy to do that. And at this time, I ask everybody to please stand. We're going to worship through song one more time. We'll see everybody back here next Sunday. Let's go.